Good Friday. Welcome, Anchor Church. Welcome to Friday Church. A little more casual, a little more laid back. Jordan did, get, did not get that memo, but he looks great. But on a serious note, today is Good Friday. And Jesus, it's Good Friday because Jesus suffered greatly. He was crucified on this day. And while it was not good for Jesus, it's great for us. It is serious because Jesus paid a very heavy price to forgive our sins and to give us salvation through his sacrifice. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9.22 tells us that there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And that's what today is. Today is the day that Jesus was crucified and shed his blood on our behalf. So again, it is a serious holiday, but it's a holiday that we celebrate because without this, we could not have salvation. We could not have forgiveness of sins. So go ahead and prepare yourselves as we watch this video and then go right into Jordan's sermon. Well, hello, Anchor Church. Welcome back to Online Church. And it is a good Friday. It is the good Friday. It's also apparently casual Friday. And no, I didn't get the memo, Corey. Uh, secondly, I was telling the guys earlier that I actually look better today than on the, the casual Friday where I interviewed with Jared. So now you know the background of how I got hired as well. But um, today we are going to be getting to go through learning about the purpose and person of Jesus Christ. And before we get there, I just want to say thank you for joining us. If you are joining us online this evening, I pray that you would get on to the YouVersion app and you would look into our events page and there should be notes that you can follow along with. They should also pop up on the screen as we go. Um, but would love to have you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 27, verse 45. And my hope for all of us today is that we would be able to see clearly the purpose and person of Jesus Christ, that his purpose is fulfilled and that the person of Jesus is glorified. So today, let's start in verse 45. It said, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, le sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And to help visualize what's happening here, a lot of the times when we see this word darkness, it's communicated in the gospel as being a figurative darkness. But right here in this case, it's actually literal or indicative. So, in other words, this time thick clouds are coming in, they've rolled in, it's darkening the light of the day. It's three in the afternoon at this moment. The sun is at its brightest point in the day, but it is dark. And, and Christ says his famous line, but I can't help but think <laughs> back to my childhood and think about the times when I would go to my grandparents' house, my great-grandparents' house in West Texas, and on more than one occasion, these huge, dark clouds would come rolling in over Amarillo, and we'd be out there, my brother, my sister, and I, we'd be out and playing in the backyard, 
And it wasn't until my parents noticed that the light of day had been darkened that they would call us in. Um, but there was more than one occasion where I was questioning whether it was safe to be outside. And so I can just imagine this is what it must have been like to be there uh, with Christ on the cross. And then he says his famous line, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Well, Jesus is actually quoting scripture. And this comes straight out of Psalm 22, which I would be delighted if you would take time after this sermon to go back to Psalms 22 and just read that entire chapter and, and, and think and reflect on what Christ has done for us this day. So furthermore, a few weeks, a, a few weeks ago, uh, my students and I, who have been joining me through a, studies, a study in the life of Jesus, and so we've been taking a critical look at the life of Jesus through the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then even John from, from time to time will include him in that mix as well. Uh, but a few weeks ago, the students and I studied the multiple times that Jesus had foretold the disciples <laughs> about his death. Now I'm smiling because I just think about the reaction that Jesus got from the disciples, but... We're going to discuss that in just a moment. But time and time again, Jesus tells them, I'm going to die. He tells them time and time again that I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and I'm going to be put to death. And each time he tells them that he's going to die, he also tells them, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. But unfortunately, the disciples suffered from something apparently most men, myself included, suffer from, which is something called selective hearing. And they didn't hear Jesus say, I'm going to rise again. They just heard the first part, I'm going to die. Well, this is detrimental to their understanding of the person and purpose of Jesus Christ. And here's why. They believed that the person of Jesus Christ was in fact, the Messiah, but the Messiah being a deliverer of an estate, right? Being the one who was supposed to free us. They took that and they applied that to their context rather than the broad context of history and the broad context of creation. And so rather than thinking about sin, they thought about their circumstances and in that moment, they were being held in Roman captivity. And they desired more than anything to be freed from Roman captivity. And so they believed that Jesus had come to literally set up his reign, set up his kingdom, and begin to reign on earth right then and there. This is why James and John come to him and say, hey, let us sit to your left and to your right. And Jesus tells them, you do not know what you're asking. Well, later on, they would understand this after the resurrection. But in the meantime, they had a false understanding of what it meant to know the person of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus. They believed that Jesus was Yes, the Messiah, but he was here for different reasons than he actually was. Well, while Jesus, having said time and time again that he was here to save that which was lost, right? He came to save those who were lost. And it even says in 1 Timothy 1.15, it says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul mentions, I am the worst of them. Well, we could all say that. But don't get this wrong. Don't miss this. Don't get it wrong. Don't misunderstand the person and the purpose of Jesus. You see, the person of Jesus, he's not your genie. You know, it might... It might Seems silly to think about that, but oftentimes it, it comes into a, a tough situation in life we come to and 
we take out our pocket genie and we rub his face on our hands and we start praying to him and we say, oh, Jesus, 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 please, please, please. And then things get better, right? And then we put our pocket Jesus away. And then later things get rough again and we take our pocket genie out, Jesus, and we start doing the same thing again. And it's cyclical and, and terrible and it's a terrible misunderstanding of who the person of Jesus is. You see, Jesus is not your genie. Jesus is not your Santa for the same reasons. He's not your therapist. He's not even, he's not even your paramedic. And while God can do all of those things, don't misunderstand me, God provides for me in ways that I cannot even begin to describe. Now I can tell you testimony and testimony and testimony after testimony in my own life of the way that he's provided for me and the way that he's provided me comfort and the way that he has even healed me in some ways. So don't, say, don't, don't think that I'm sitting here saying that that's not legitimate, but that's not why he came to earth. He didn't come to earth just to heal people. He didn't come to earth just to comfort he came to save that which was lost. See, if we misunderstand the person of Jesus, then we are misunderstanding what our response to him should be. And if we misunderstand the purpose of Jesus' life on earth, then we will misunderstand the purpose of our life here on earth. It is my purpose to make his purpose my purpose. He gave me my mission. But back to talking about how he was betrayed with the students. When Christ was foretelling of his death, the word that Christ used in communicating this to the disciples was that he would be betrayed. And he says in Mark 9, 30 through 32, he says, Then they left that place and made their way through Galilee, but he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching the disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Well, that word betrayed, let's pay attention to that for a minute. That word betrayed is para didotai. Now, I don't know if I'm actually saying that right, so give me some grace here. But this means deliver up or to hand over. And it was used both of Judah's betrayal of Jesus and of God's delivering up of Jesus to death for the redemption of sinners. And the latter idea is probably intended here. Now, the point I want you to see is this. Jesus was aware and actively participating in his own death. He wasn't surprised by it. They didn't finally just catch up to him. He wasn't avoiding it. He went to the cross actively for you. And this is not happening to him, but he, act, he is actively, even in this moment, while he's on the cross, anticipating his death and resurrection because he knows his goal, he knows his purpose, and he knows why he's there. And he tells the disciples time and time again before this, I only desire to do my Father's work. I have food that you do not know about. Back in 47, it says, When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and offered him a drink. But the rest said, Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Now, gave up, right there at the very end, gave up is one word, in, in the Greek, and it's a theomy. And it's actually an active indicative verb. Now, let me tell you what that means. That means that 
Essentially, the author wants you to know that this real event, in this real event, Jesus is actively leaving behind his battered, beaten body. He gave up his spirit. Nobody took it from him. He desired to do this for you so that by the blood he spilt and by the sacrifice he was made into, you and I would be atoned for, that our sins would be atoned for, that we can have eternal life through Christ Jesus. Now, God's law, when it was given to Moses, included instructions on how to build a temple. And I want to tell you that before we read this next verse. It said, suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from the top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. Now, in these instructions, which had to be done perfectly, the room behind the curtain was called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And this is where God's presence would dwell inside the tabernacle or inside the temple. And the, the, the high priest was the only one who was allowed to come in there. And only once a year and never without blood. Never without blood. God's presence filled that room and God tore open in a single motion the barrier between him and his throne room, between his people and his throne room, excuse me. Since this time, Christ has entered in as an eternal intercessor on our behalf by the offering up of his own blood. He comes into that room and intercedes for us on our behalf by his own blood. Lastly, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, and this is a, a set of verses that I fell in love with a long time ago because it just showed me what a great high priest we have in Jesus, what a great king we have in Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, entered into that place. He passed through the heavens. This Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. The person of Jesus is the Son of God. Let's make no mistake about it. But more specifically, the person of Jesus is your king and he's my king. He's not just a king. He is your king and he's my king. And this doesn't come, come down to whether I decide he's the king or not. He's the king regardless of what I believe about him. But he gives us an opportunity to recognize him as the king of all creation as a king over our lives. You see, all these things happened. All these things happened. He hung on the cross for you and for me for the purpose of God to be fulfilled, for the purposes of his Father to be fulfilled. He came with a mission, and when he hung on that cross and with his dying breath said, it is finished, he crossed the finish line. And praise God for that because now we get to enter into that throne room with God and we no longer have to go through a high priest. We no longer have to have a mediary, but our mediary is God himself in Jesus Christ and he dwells within us by his Holy Spirit and praise God for that. The gospel is this. The gospel is exactly this, what we've been talking about this entire time. But it's summed up nicely in Romans 5.8. It says, God demonstrates his love for us 
and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, if you're with us today and you don't know about the price that was paid for you and you don't understand what this means, let me briefly explain it for you. When God created everything, he created all things according to his perfect plan. Now, eventually, man sinned and fell away from that perfect plan. But God was not phased by this, and he had a plan on how to reconcile man back to himself. And that plan's name was Jesus. That plan's name was King Jesus. And he told Jesus that he would make his enemies a footstool. And he's actively doing that and has actively done that. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss the fact that brokenness is all around us. Don't ignore the reality that we all live in. We can see brokenness and a lack of hope in this world around us. We look for it in all sorts of ways. Maybe you have looked for it in the bottle. Maybe you've looked for it in drugs in relationships with other broken people. Maybe you've looked for hope in areas where we should never expect to find an eternal source of hope. But that's because this world is broken and filled with sin. And if you don't believe that you and I are both sinful, it says in Romans 3.23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, it goes on talking about, but God gives us a free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus didn't do this so that we could claim glory for ourselves. He did this because only he could do it. He hung on that cross because he was only him that could have done this. He was the only one that could have fulfilled this need. He was the only one worthy and capable. You and I, were not capable. We don't, admit, we don't measure up, first of all, but we, we, second of all, could not. We could not do what Christ did. And so he did it for us. This afternoon, if, if you don't know Jesus, I, I pray that you would strongly consider making him the Lord of your life because he is your king. And his purpose was to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Father, I come before you right now, humbly, and I just ask that you would work in and through each of us to reach the lost, to fulfill the purpose which you gave us. That while we are here on this earth, that we would make it known to our neighbors, that we would make it known to our family and friends, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ saves us from our sins by his own blood, by hanging on the cross, God. Father, I pray that anybody listening right now that has these questions in their mind, can I be forgiven? Yes, that you would Affirm, affirm to them that yes, they are forgiven. That because of what Christ did on the cross, that they are forgiven. And that all they have to do is reach out and take hold of that free gift of salvation. 
and that all we have to do in order to do that is turn away from our sin and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that in this moment that they wouldn't let fear, that they wouldn't let anxiety, that they wouldn't let pride, that they wouldn't let any other desires of their heart get in the way of reaching out and taking hold of the one gift that could change their entire life. Father, I pray all these things in your name. Amen. So if you're with us today, thank you for joining us. We are so glad you were able to come and worship with us and observe the Word of God as we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, taking the sins of the world on himself. What a, what a horrible day for Jesus, but what an amazing day for the rest of the world. What an amazing day for us and a day that we can celebrate and have joy in and reflect on the goodness of God because we are saved from our sins. If you found this message helpful, if you found this message to give you a better understanding of who Jesus is, the person and purpose of Jesus, I pray that you would reach out, reach out to us, write in the comments below and tell us what's going on in your heart. Tell us what's going on in your mind. Reach out to us. Maybe talk to one of our pastors on staff. You can even go to our staff page at anchorchurch.com and reach out to us that way if you'd like. We would love to hear from you. I pray that you have a wonderful evening with family as you reflect on the message of Christ. And don't forget to go read Psalm chapter 22 as you reflect on his love and his mercy as he hung on that cross. God bless.
it sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the same 